Good morning. Uh, my name is Larry Hughes. I'm a retired captain from New York City Correction Department. And I've been retired now over 20 years. And I've owned and operated uh, the Hughes Institute for Security Training for the past 18 years. Um, and the purpose of this audio is to give individuals insight how the industry operates because I get so many emails and I get so many telephone calls people need information. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I can't give them as much information on the telephone as opposed to uh, being appearing in person. A lot of time I have to come by the office or whatever and they want to know the licensing process and that what I'm going to uh, that's what I'm going to discuss today. Now, um, first of all, New York State requires to work in the security field, you must be at least 18 years of age, uh, you must have a criminal, criminal record, you must have a New York State non-driver's ID, or either a learner's permit or a driver's license, and a social security card. You see? Uh, now, um, you must go to a state-approved school and do a three-day training class to get your eight-hour certificate, which is one day, and a 16-hour certificate, which is two additional days, so a total of three days. Now, uh, I know that's not a whole lot of training, but I'm convinced that uh, we can give an individual enough information where they can go out there and function as a security officer. Uh, one of the things that we do here, besides the state curriculum that we use, we add additional information. Because you know, I know that uh, the biggest problem you have with security officers today, and the reason why most, many of them are frustrated, is because they're not getting enough information. If they understood how certain sites, how certain companies work, they would be a lot more uh, comfortable doing the job. And one of the things I discovered uh, that uh, many, uh, it's not so much the money that they're making, it's the conditions under which they work. You see, if they're being treated fairly and they're given proper information. Now let me give you an example. Let's say for example, you can have four persons working for a company. And each one of them making a different salary. And these individuals have to meet up in the bank on Friday and started talking, you know, because they were in the same uniform or whatever, and then start uh, discussing the place where they work at, the location, and what they're making. One guy's making uh, $12 an hour, his girl making $14 an hour, here's another individual making $16 an hour. Now the one that's making $12 and $14 an hour will feel like they are being cheated. But uh, the way uh, contract security works is that they get contracts with organizations. Every organization, every client does not pay the same thing. You see, if you work corporate security, naturally, you know, in the corporate world, they're going to pay more for security. If you work at a Burger King or fast food joint, uh, they are not going to pay as much as the corporate world. So the individuals assigned to those areas going to make less. Now, thank God, now the, the, the minimum wage for security officers now is what, $13 an hour? State law. So you're going to see a lot of improvements in the industry. Um, but that's just one example. That's just one example why there's frustration. But no one sits down and explain to them why things are the way they are. So a lot of that frustration was going away if they understood. Uh, another problem is that many locations don't have post order folders. If you have post order folders intact, which is required by the state, if you have post order folders intact, it would tell the individual everything that they need to do on that post. What time they're supposed to report, uh, what uh, what uh, tours that they should make, uh, uh, patrols, how often the patrols are made, what time they go to lunch, you see, uh, what time they go on break, who's supposed to relieve them, and all of that. And uh, these are simple things, but a lot of things are not intact. 
using a network on a security site, the first thing I do is look for the post auto folder. And it tells me, it tells me not just uh, not just uh, what I'm responsible for, it tells me a lot about the company and all of that. And sometimes it goes for us uh, uh, tell me how many man hours they get. Um, uh, because see, security, contract security, clients pay by man hours. If they want 20 guards, they're going to pay for 20 guards. They're not going to pay for overtime. You see? They'll pay for 20 guards 40 hours a week. Now, if any overtime incurs, like say, for example, uh, one individual is two hours late and somebody had to stay two hours over. So, that person making the overtime, that money is going to come out the company prop profits. You see? They're going to make less money if someone calls in sick. Um, and you have to pay another security officer um, uh, overtime for working that additional shift. So companies can lose a whole lot of money real fast uh, that way. That why it's important that uh, security officers act responsible, be to work in the shoe, and um, and on time. Being on time is so important. Uh, now, um, these are little things that frustrate security officers, but no one is telling them this. Unfortunately, I'm very critical about the supervision in the industry because many times uh, these individuals are really not equipped themselves to uh, instruct these in, uh, the, the security officers about what they're supposed to do and what they're not supposed to do. And a lot of time, the information they give them uh, is not accurate. Because even from a school point of view, I get a lot of feedback uh, from individuals about uh, what's going on out there on the sites. And plus, I've worked these sites for years, too, so I know. I've supervised sites, and I know. Um, another example. And it has to do with the, with the penal code. Now, I really like how they've codified the laws uh, uh, for security officers. Now, security officers' legal authority comes from Article 35 of the New York State Penal Code. And that's the same part of the penal code that, uh, that governs uh, police officers, uh, correction officers, and all security and police personnel in the state. The only difference is that they get much more training and they have much more authority to act. But uh, what the, what they did, see, in 1992 when they passed the Security Guard Act, prior to 1992 there was no rules governing security officers in New York State. They did anything they want, but it was so outrageous out here, a lot of use of force, uh, a lot of false arrests, and it was just so much craziness going on. I mean, people. Uh, got committed to jail for 20 years for serious crimes, got out and went right to the security company and they hired them. And many of these individuals committed crimes working at security offices like murder, rape, robbery. So it got so bad, the state and the public got tired and they decided to create some legislation called the Security Guard Act that made it mandatory that you must come to a state approved school, get a minimum amount of training and you must be fingerprinted and issued an ID card, and um, and a background check is done. Now, if an individual has been arrested, that don't stop you from becoming a security officer. It's just the most serious offenses, like murder, rape, robbery. You you know you're not going to get no license, you know. But uh, most of the foolishness that these individuals go to jail. You see, my background in the in the criminal justice system is in the jails and the correctional facilities. And you have much more closer contact on a daily basis with criminals than cops. Cops apprehend and arrest them and that's it. You know what I mean? So you have a broader understanding. You have a broader understanding uh, what's going on with the criminal mind. You know? Uh, not only that, uh, people must understand that jails, uh, correctional facilities and jails and prisons is a microcosm. In other words, they're just small communities. 
there are a, those institutions is a reflection of what's going on in the macrocosm, the greater society. In other words, and play in English, from what I'm saying to you, the same damn thing that goes on in the community goes on in here. It's a small community. I mean, you got a lot of extortion. You got robbery. Uh, you got a lot of serious assaults with weapons. You know, I, I know 20 years ago when I retired in my jail that I was in, we was getting at least uh, 20, uh, at least three to four stabbings and slashes a day, and I know it's way worse now. Um, but these are the kind of things that don't hit the, the press. You know, a lot of, uh, it may get cut by another inmate. It really not a newsworthy story, so it don't sell a newspaper, so you don't hear about these things, but it, it's here, and it's very real. Now, so what I'm saying, I didn't patrol the streets, but I had uh, I had a big experience dealing directly with offenders, you see, and getting a greater understanding. You see, a big misconception about security officers' authority, hmm, the, the state codified the law, the penal code, in such a way to give security officers a certain amount of uh, legal authority uh, to act. Uh, but your legal authority is limited, naturally, because you're not a police officer or a peace officer, but it gives you enough authority to act. Now, that legal authority comes from Article 35 of the New York State Penal Code. What I did, I came up with a very creative idea to, to teach individuals about their legal authority in a quick, fast way. Now, there's a lot in New York State Penal Code, uh, but what the state did, they touched on two areas of the Penal Code in terms of legal authority for security officers. One, they give you the right to use physical force under certain circumstances, but there is guidelines, you see? And if you work within the guidelines, you'll be perfectly fine. Uh, and it also gives security officers the authority to arrest. Unfortunately, <laughs> in the training, many individuals are not equipped to, uh, to convey this to the, uh, the new security officers because they don't understand it themselves. And, uh, and the reason why I understand it so clearly because I was spoon fed for years and I was a trainer, an instructor in correction. I spoon fed it to correction officers. And many times they didn't quite get it. And you can see what, I'm, uh, what I mean in a few minutes. Now let's say for example, Article 35 of the New York State Penal Code gives you the right to use physical force. One, to stop an attack on you. Unfortunately, many security officers feel that they can't defend themselves. If you are being attacked physically, you can't defend yourself. And the rule of thumb is this year. If the attack is using punches, throwing punches, at you, you can throw punches. And if the attacker continues to throw punches, you can continue to throw punches to defend yourself. Now, okay. But, and many veterans, security officers, I mean, correctional officers and police officers fail to comprehend this. And this is how a lot of times they get in trouble. And I was the penal code said, you can defend yourself. You can use force as long as that attacker is trying to use force against you. But at whatever point did that attacker stop using force or become incapable for whatever reason? Maybe the last punch you throw hit that person kind of hard and they decide to quit. You must stop. You cannot continue to use force beyond that point. You know, and if you deal, you're gonna end up in some serious trouble today. Because the reason why, because this camera's all over the place. The camera across the street, this building had cameras all throughout the place. So you go. And then one of the things I realized over the years that the general public tend to be tend to be uh, sympathetic toward uh, perks. You know. People want to be protected, you know, but a lot of times they'll, they will testify or they will side with the person. Like say for example, let's take a young guy that's angry about something and I tell the individual, well you have to leave the building. The individual just like, punch me in the face, right? And we get into a physical altercation. 
naturally the physical altercation, a crowd going to gather instantly. People are going to run across the street and around the corner and all of that. But the majority of the individuals that they are watching this, they only want to see what me as a security officer did. Why did that security officer had to hit that poor, poor child? Now, this individual, 17 years old, I've been in jail 10 times for serious stuff, but yet still, you still refer to him as a, a poor child that actually assaulted me. So, the point I'm trying to make is this year, so you have to be very careful. First of all, what I train people to do about the use of physical force, the use of physical force should always be a last resort. And sometimes you can be in a very threatening situation. I came up years ago with the technique that I was training uh, young um, correction officers to use. You don't fight fights that you can't win. If there's two or three persons, I caught you know I create this term and bow them out of situations gracefully. I you don't want to run out of the situation scared. But if you see the odds against you, you back away. Okay, you got that. You got that. Back away. Get on that radio and call a 1013 and get some help there. You see what I'm saying? As soon as possible. But you don't try to take on two or three persons. If the person is physically bigger than you, you know, you should not try to, uh, what happens many times, especially younger people, they let the ego tell them that they must do that. Now, if that person is 6'7 and weigh 270 pounds, you're probably not going to win that fight. And 24 years old too. <laughs> You're not going to win that fight. So the best thing to do is back out of it. And let's say, for example, uh, you're doing retail, and someone just shoplifts something. And well, you know, now to make an arrest, now the penal code gives us authority to make an arrest. But we, the person has to leave that store or be exiting out of the store. You cannot. You cannot arrest a person, even if they have something under the coat in their pocket, while they're still on the premise, because they are capable of paying for it at any point. And I can tell you from personal experience, these criminals are very adept at that. They'll steal something on the second floor. If they know they're being watched, by the time they get to the door, they would drop it in the house, something like that. You see what I'm saying? Now. Two things I want to point out here. One is your approach to individuals. Whenever you approach somebody, whether it could be something a casual violation of the rules and regulations, or it could be something uh, serious like a theft or, or something, you always approach the individual at all times. Melon, come here a minute. She's not going to have a stand over here. Stand right here. You always approach the person at arm length in a defensive posture. And how you do that, stay professional, and you walk, oh, excuse me, ma'am, excuse me, sir, do you mind remaining here? Now, for a security officer, once you tell a person they're under arrest, or once you detain them, the arrest has to start place. Police officers can stop someone. They can even put the cuffs on you and terminate that arrest. We as security officers, once we start the rest, we got to complete it. Otherwise, you'll be sued. Well, otherwise, you can be sued for false arrest, for false imprisonment. You see, now I'm showing you a technique. What did I say to you when I walked up to you? Excuse me, Matt. Do you mind remaining here? I didn't tell you was an arrest. I asked you. If you consent to it, then <laughs> that's your problem. I didn't tell you was an arrest. Cops do it all the time. When they pull you over, let me see your driver's license and registration. You show it to them. And if they suspect that you might be having something in the car, like a gun or drugs, they'll say, do you mind me searching your car? To the average person, it sounds like a cop telling them they're going to search it. You see what I'm saying? What they're doing is actually, if you consent your rights away, then you can't say that that, 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 it, that was a legal search. But if you, I guarantee you, if you tell that cop, say, no, you're not searching my car, now please get a supervisor here. They're not going to search that car. 
Now, if they got a strong belief that you might be cursing, they will get a supervisor. And they will get permission to switch that car. But how they do casually, you know, a lot of times there's people who send it away. You said, sir, with all due respect, no, I don't want you to switch my car. I'm not consenting to it. I suggest that you bring a supervisor in. Now that cop will write you about 10 tickets because he can find everything. <laughs> now, come here, man, I'm not finished. You'll find everything in the world to write a ticket on you for. You know what I mean? But he's not going to search that car. Now, if you notice, ma'am, do you mind waiting here? Now, this is a defensive posture. I don't care whether you know a warrior or you know, prize fight or whatever. You get too close on that perk, you might get your head knocked off. You got to create some distance between you and the person that you're approaching. He's like, ma'am, now if you get hustled to walk me to decide to take your pocketbook and knock my head off, at least I can back away. I can create some distance. You see what I'm saying? And hopefully get close enough to that door where I can ease out of it. You know what I'm saying? The reason why security officers get assaulted sometimes because they're not being trained in a proper technique to approach people. You always treat them in a professional manner, talk to them nice and calm. Do you mind waiting right here? Most people, well, I got to wait in here. They go wall out a little bit. And this, man, just wait a minute. You're waiting for the to come or whatever, the police to come. <laughs> man, just be calm. I'll let you know in one second. You know. Now, if that person decides, get out my way and just, what I suggest to you, get my avenue of escape. Get my avenue of escape. Security officers, the most important thing for you to do is to report things. We are the eyes and ear uh, of the police and the other first responders. What you're supposed to do, call the police, tell them what happened, give them a description, the direction of flight. Once we report something, we've done our job. See, in the penal code, we're not obligated to pursue suspects. All we're required to do is report it. Cops now, they have to. Like, I see security officers chasing individuals down the street and stuff like that. They should never do that. And the reason why is today, petty criminals carry weapons. And it's a good possibility you can get her to kill. Once they hit the sidewalk, you're supposed to call the police department, tell them what happened, and cops usually respond real fast and things like that. I know from personal experience. Sometimes they can apprehend them, sometimes they can't. But you've done your job once you report it. But you don't take it upon yourself that you want to restrain. Now, something serious happened, like you just assaulted an employee or uh, someone else. Now, we got, we, we got, I don't have to use physical force on you because I'm not going to let you go. But a uh, minor theft or something, they didn't know. That's, our job is not to engage in physical confrontations unless we have to. The penal code gives us a certain amount of legal authority. Okay, ma'am, thank you. It gives us a certain amount of legal authority to act, but it didn't obligate us to use physical force. You see what I'm saying? Now, the second area that Article 35 of New York State Penal Code gives you to use physical force, that is to protect a third party. And <coughs> It's extremely important that individuals know who is considered a third party. If we all work at the same site, and someone decides to start punching me out because I'm an old man, and they feel like they can do that, any one of you individuals that are signed that have the legal authority to use physical force on that person attacking me to stop that attack on me. Now, one of the things I always tell people, believe it or not, this you, Always use your interpersonal skills first. And believe it or not, Mario, I find in my experience, most of the time it works. Usually security come on the scene and say, hey, break it up or whatever. If there's a fight or something, they usually stop. Now, I don't break up fights unless it's one of my coworkers or somebody involved. Because, you know, you know, sometimes these stores, somebody claims this person cut in front of them or step on their toes and all that. And you get full phase fights, not just in stores, other places too. People are frustrated and they start fighting each other. Now I don't break up fights because always come back and take me. I'm gonna call 911 and pray that the police uh, arrive quickly. And most of the time they do. Now, what I train security officers to do 
if there's a fight, a physical confrontation, now you call 911, you call your supervision and hope that someone can come immediately. But if the fight is one sided, then you're going to have to intervene. Let's say, for example, I'm beating this woman down to the ground. Not right? Me. Now, look, I'm, be no, I'm the same. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to you know. <laughs> Now, look how big I am, you know. And you get fights like that where you get a 200 pound woman beating a 90 pound woman down in the ground. Now, you know, as a security officer, you prefer that the cops and supervision come, but you're going to have to do something to do it quick before somebody get killed or seriously hurt. Now, what I suggest, the technique I suggest, if you have to, you can come down to that. What you want to do is walk in between them, right? Preferably, you want to back the person who's taking the beating away. And they extend your arm like this here. And what I'm going to do, back away. Uh, you know, an eagle is going to tell most people, although they're getting beat down, you know, they still want to continue on. But what you do, you just back them away and try to back them to a wall or something. And in the meantime, you create some distance between you and the other person, you see, and hopefully help get there soon. Now, if that person get too aggressive and they want to go past me, then I'm going to have to do my thing, which I don't want to do, you know. Never, if I can help it, you know. So, uh, that's a simple technique. You don't have to be uh, into uh, martial arts or boxing or anything like that. That just plain common sense and judgment. You want to isolate the person who's losing, you see. And believe it or not, deep down inside, they glad somebody come and rescue them. <laughs> and always remember this here. Once the police officer come on the scene, they are in charge. Just like the fire department, when they respond, they come on, the come on the scene, they are in charge. And I love it that way. You know, you you know they need uh, they need my assistance or whatever they need doors open keys or whatever or need to escort them or something like that to assist them. But once they come on scene, they went back. They don't enjoy. And guess what? You know, anytime there's an unusual incident, you got to write a report. And I'll show you a quick technique how to write a good report that's short and sweet without having to go into details. Like let's say for example, there was a fist fight uh, between two tenants. And it got out of hand, you had to call the police. You say, well, at 350, there was a fist fight involving tenant, so and so and so, and tenant, so and so and so. I immediately called 911. They arrived three minutes later and took control of the situation. See how you write yourself right out of it? Now, if you want any additional information, you better interview the police officers. Because I can't tell you anymore. They took control of the situation. You, you, sometimes I'm showing you a little technique how to not get too involved in situations. And, and actually, once they come on the scene, you shouldn't be. And I let the police officers do their job. The firemen, too. Now, you got some security officers, they're all on the scene and this and that. That's not part of your job. And in the long run, it'll cause problems for you. Then you, six months later, you get subpoenaed to go to court to testify about something that you shouldn't have been involved in. You know? Cops are trained to go to court and give testimony. Read that. Okay, uh, this segment I will speak about the licensing process. Uh, and I find there's some major frustration for uh, new security guards as well as security guards that uh, have to renew their license. Because most of them don't understand how the process works. You will have two state agencies involved. You have the New York State Criminal Justice Division, which the security guard program is a part of that. Now, the Criminal Justice Division uh, mandate all the training for police officers, peace officers, and security officers in the state. It's a vast agency. Now, unfortunately, um, the security guard program have never got the funding that they should have gotten and and never really had the amount of staff that they should have. The people are doing a fantastic job of there considering what they're up against. Now, uh, 18 years ago, there was close to a million security officers. That was before 9-11. Now, uh, I would estimate, I don't know the exact numbers, but I would estimate there's at least about 3 million security guards 
in New York State. That's a lot of people to process. Now, when an individual come in to uh, do the security uh, registration process, okay, when a student uh, attends a security school, um, to register an individual, the student must sign the attendance roster and that they attend that class. They must put their social security number, their last name, the date of birth, sex, and phone number. Now, 90% of the problems that we have is because some individuals don't put the complete social security number down. Why? I don't know. They usually one number off or whatever, right? And uh, I'll explain that in a little while why that's so important. Because actually the state rich you basically by your social security number. Now, so they put the social security number, last name, first name, middle initial. And if you have a middle initial, it's on your ID card. You must put it. But you know why? If you have a common name like uh, Jose Rivera, they might have 20 Jose Rivera's. But if your name is Jose J. Rivera, you know, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll be credited properly. So a lot of times when you don't put the full name, don't put that middle initial, it, it doesn't get recorded. Yeah. Or your social security number is off one. But we've, you know, we've become very adaptive for correcting this stuff, you know. Now, okay, they signed that tennis roster. The student must fill up one of these orange sheets. It's called, um, uh, it's called a student data sheet. They must complete this. A lot of times, the students don't fill these out correctly. They leave one, one number off or one letter, and it doesn't get recorded. And the school, at the end of the day, the school wants to complete a school data sheet who conducted the class. Now, uh, you have seven days to mail this stuff out. We almost exclusively mail everything out the same day that they attend the class. Almost exclusively. Now, um, but what we do, we check all the, the student data sheet, we, we retype the uh, attendance roster, and we keep a record of everybody who attended school. Um, and we submit it to Albany. Now, when we submit this paperwork, I mean, Albany is not that far away, but on the average, you probably take about three days. <laughs> Is a simply two, three hours away, but for some reason, I, I, I think because uh, I've been up there, you ever been up there? That is a vast, big department division, you know? Uh, and because of the amount of people that are requesting this training and licenses and renewal, uh, now, surprisingly, on the average, it doesn't take them on two, three weeks at the most to get your security license back. So they're doing a fantastic job. But if there's any error on the paperwork, and we know that most of the time it's student that leaves something <coughs> out, you know, like one number off the social security number. We've had them, um, we've had them uh, the last four digits, right their birthday, <laughs> you know? Uh, and these are mistakes that shouldn't be made. Um, but it happened. Now, um, so when the security guard program receives this paperwork, what they will do, they will enter it in their database. And once they enter it in their database, then your training is forward to New York State Department of State. Like I said, you got two agencies involved. You see what I'm saying? The Department of State issues all the professional license in the state. For security guards and everybody else, you know. And once the Department of State gets it, then uh, uh, the training, then they will issue you that license, you see. Now, if there's a mistake in the paperwork, and, and uh, they scrutinize pretty well, too, because if we make one minor mistake, they send it right back to us, <laughs> you know, and we have to resubmit it. So we try hard not to make mistakes with this stuff. Uh, so even, you know, like I have a system set up, see? Oh. I have a system set up where we have at least three persons check the paperwork. Now I check everything at the end of the day. 
And even a lot of times, uh, after three or four persons checking this paperwork before we submit it, sometimes something is overlooked. It can happen, you know. You know. Surprisingly, we got 25 students in there, we never make a mistake. Any mistakes in there, we pick it up. When we submit a roster for five or six people, we find 10 mistakes in there, and that's why I'm mad. And I, I know, I know, I've been in this business long enough, I know you're not focusing. No criticism, but you're not focusing on what you're supposed to do, you know? <laughs> but um, now, um, the security guard program, they enter it in the database and then they s submit the, the, the training to the Department of State. And the Department of State will issue the license for several days after that. But what causes a delay in people getting their license usually is because they didn't fill the paperwork out right. It's incumbent upon the school to scrutinize the paperwork and make sure it's submitted right. But even under the very best circumstance, sometimes you can miss something. You see? So, um, and on the average, it takes about two or three weeks to get your license back. That's pretty fast. But, Mario, you know, years ago, uh, sometimes it took months. And see, what it is now, they have the digital fingerprinting now. Remember, for years, we did fingerprints right on site. You know what I mean? I charge people $25 for doing the fingerprints. They go to the precinct and get up to 19. I always hated fingerprinting, but you know, it was my job, what I got paid to do, $25 wasn't a whole lot of money, but it was something, it was some kind of income. And, um, but now they got the digital printing, so, um, uh, by computer, so they get the results back in a day or two. So that's why the process happens a lot faster. Now, um, and what the, the state have done, they've shifted responsibility on the school. Now, any discrepancies in the training, see before you can get on the phone, call up the state, it takes you half a day to get them most of the time, but when you do get them, but now they tell you, uh, they tell them, or, or the, the individuals submitting this stuff themselves, that's on the letter and tell them to come back to school, you know? And uh, they want us to rectify it, and we do. We do most of it because we have the record, so we keep a record of this attendance roster. We keep a personal photo on them. So we can verify the social security number that they put on their attendance roster, and we can verify the social security number that they put uh, in the personal history sheet. So many times we'll find that discrepancy right there. And we can say to the student, this is what you wrote, and this is why you delayed, you know? And what we'll do, we'll make them bring the social security card in and you'll verify the correct social security number. And, you know, we, we usually we'll email the state, they respond pretty good to it, and they'll rectify it, you know. But it delays things. Now, another issue that comes up now uh, with the licensing process, these licenses are issued for a period of two years. This, I know for a fact that the state uses some that renewal notice out for about close to 60 days in advance. If your license is going to expire in July, I can't see you before this month, well, you probably got the renewal notice. And what many people do is they don't act on it. Now, every security officer, after doing the initial eight hour pre assign and the 16 hour OJT, is required once a year to go to a state approved school and do a refresher course. It's called an eight-hour annual. You know, it's basically the same information that you got in those two courses and any new changes in the in the industry. Um, now, uh, many security companies don't monitor whether they're coming in for the training or not. Some do. So, and the state knew this for years. Yeah, people that worked for years never did an annual, but they're doing it now. Now, like say for example, if you miss uh, a year that you didn't do the eight hour annual, that second year over time to renew your license, the state will make you do two eight hour annuals. You can do one for the current year and you can do one for the year that you miss. And um, so a lot of times when people sit in their uh, renewal fee in the application, 
And he hadn't done that, you know, and he wondered why did he get the license. You just didn't notify why we let him know that you must do the annuals, you see. And uh, they have to come in and do that. And once they do it, we come in to Albany, and once they put it in the database, they'll send it over to the Department of State, and the license will be issued, you know. So I have people tell me all the time, well, you know, I sent a renewal form in now last, uh, last month. I said, well, when did you do the in our land? Last week. Well, that's why you didn't get it. <laughs> and you did the eight hour annual at the time you're supposed to do it, or around about the time that you did the renewal form, you would have your license back, you know? So, uh, but they definitely have shifted the responsibility of rectifying these situations on the school. And me personally, I don't have no problem with it, you know? I have no problem whatsoever. Um, let me see what else about the licensing process. Oh, by the way, too. See, uh, because of the security guard program, you don't have the staff to, to the model people. They need to do all the things that they're doing. Miraculously, they, they get it done. But see, uh, they didn't have the staff for enforcement. This is why you notice we had a lot of bogus companies years ago doing all kind of shady stuff out here. And um, they didn't have enough auditors to go around to all these different uh, companies and go over there. They only acted on complaints. If somebody complained to them about a uh, school or security company, then they would go and audit them, you know, and investigate them. But most of those places, they shut down. Some of those individuals, they prosecuted and put in jail. Some of the children had to fines, you know. And, um, but what the state did, came up with a very creative idea. They don't have to send an individual now to order the company. They can do it right from the computer. Every security officer, when you get hired by a security company, that company's supposed to send a $25 money order or check in for you, you know, that you're an employee of the company, you know. And now the state knows when your annual is due. You see what I'm saying? And, and when time to renew your license, what they'll do, you know, uh, they will notify your company that you must take this individual off the schedule if they let the license expire. And if they don't, they hit these companies with some big hefty fines. So most companies now, if you let your license expire, they're not going to let you work. Because <laughs> they're not going to take the chance of being fined, you know, or whatever else, and I don't blame them. So there's no way to get around doing the training now, the required training. And um, so I advise individuals try to send that renewal notice and then do that refresher course as early as possible so you don't get delayed. I mean, you know, we'd like to see people working. We don't want them to be out of work, but uh, you will be out of work until that new license comes. And no company's gonna take those kind of chances today.